Hey everybody, I hope you guys had a great week. My name is Garrett Hartle, this is Reach Out Reptiles, and today I need to write up a breeding loan contract for a little deal I'm doing. Not with this guy, of course. Everybody wants a piece of his fine little snake booty. Whoa, buddy. Oh, and my wife isn't home, so please don't tell her that I have the snake upstairs and on the couch. Thanks, you guys are the best. Okay, maybe there's a reason for that rule. Ugh. You guys imagine if he broke the glass owl I would be in so much trouble anyway breeding loans so first off what is it what is a breeding loan a breeding loan is basically just two different parties getting together and uh, sharing their animals or genetics and working out like kind of a split between them that's mutually beneficial now right off the get-go I want to make a huge warning here most of the people who ask me about breeding loan situations are beginning breeders. Okay, I am going to very seriously warn against breeding loans for beginners. A breeding loan situation is a complicated affair even among advanced keepers. The problem is there's so many factors to consider that could go wrong. In fact, there are a lot of people that absolutely hands down refuse to breed breeding loans. And if I'm being honest with you, I would be among that crowd. The only thing is, here at Reach Out Reptiles, we're working with some, some pretty rare bloodlines on occasion, trying to preserve, especially when it comes to like specific locality animals. Because we can't import reticulated pythons into the United States anymore. So if I have a male and the only other female in the country is over on the other side of the country, sometimes a breeding loan situation is the only one that even makes sense but there are a lot of risks. And that's why you really wanna have a contract written up and try to think of everything in advance. Ultimately, when reality hits, things turn out so differently so often that it's gonna be a really tough situation to iron out after the fact. So let's go ahead and jump into the contract right now and we'll get into some of that stuff. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do with our document is just dictate what it is, which is here, who I am right here and who you are with the snake or snakes in question. So we'll put a description of them here and a descriptive picture of them here and make sure that this picture shows any identifying marks in their pattern that might distinguish them from any other snake. Okay, time out. I wanna ask you guys the question of the day to comment below. But before I do, I would just ask you, please consider supporting us at Reach Out Reptiles just by hitting the like button, uh, throwing us a subscribe if you aren't subscribed already, and then answer me this question. If you were given free reign to use somebody else's reptile collection as your own breeding collection. And they said, I want you to do a breeding loan situation with me where you take care of my colony and I'm gonna give you access to all the genetics I have. Who would that breeder be? Comment down below. Now any agreement that you're entering into with somebody can be completely custom. So really what you need to do is sit down and hash out with the person that you're thinking about doing this breeding loan with what are gonna be the exact terms. Now remember the whole point of a breeding loan contract is so that everybody can refer to it after the fact. So you're gonna wanna cover things that commonly can go wrong in different situations. I personally recommend that you keep a template which you can tweak and add to with each subsequent lesson learned. Well, let's go ahead and jump into it here. Okay, let's focus on the first term here. The receiver, that's you, guarantees that the animal will receive the best possible care. The animal will also be kept in the best possible way to encourage breeding behavior. The receiver will, in case of death, freeze and preserve the animal. The dead animal remains the property of reach out reptiles and the receiver must inquire about what to do with the carcass. This first point is number one on my contract because my animals, the breeders, health and benefit is my number one priority whenever I enter into a breeding loan. 
when animals are breeding, it's a messy business. I mean, especially with reticulated pythons, they've even been known to kill each other when you try to put them together and have them breed, which is common for a lot of species, but obviously that's going to bring up some issues if you have a breeding loan situation where somebody else has possession of your animal and it dies. Anything that's important to me to make sure that my animal is kept and handled in a certain way, I'm going to discuss just so that we make sure that we're on the same page with all this stuff. Now the part about the dead animal remaining the property of reach out reptiles, God forbid this should ever happen, but it has happened and I've seen way too many times where somebody says, oh it died or something happened and now I can't give it back to you. And that always leaves the owner wondering, did you sell the animal without me? Did you send it out to somebody else on breeding loan? Are you actually keeping it and hiding it from me? And all of a sudden, somebody that you trusted very much tells you that they threw away the carcass of an animal that belonged to you without taking a picture or having any proof of it at all starts to raise some serious doubts in that relationship. So that's what this part is about. I want the option to at least come up and inspect the dead animal myself in person if that should ever happen. At least that gives you a fallback and something, some kind of accountability as to what's going to happen if they fell through on this first point. Okay, moving on to the second term, reach out reptiles will always be the owner of this animal. Any decisions regarding the outside involvement of any person or party other than the receiver listed above must be made by reach out reptiles. Now this second point should be obvious, but I will tell you time and time again, I have seen where when you project into the future what a situation or a breeder loan is going to be like, everything seems like it'll be wonderful and easy. When reality hits or you begin to look at the past, all of a sudden people start to feel some kind of funny ways about things. For example, let's say that I owned an animal and I sent it to somebody on breeder loan and they end up keeping it for five years. I've seen it happen where someone starts to feel like they've put so much time and food and money into the animal that maybe the amount of money they spend housing it, growing it up, whatever that case may be, they think it, it meets or exceeds the value of the animal. They might start to feel like they deserve something or they're entitled to at least a partial, if not full ownership of that animal, which is obviously ridiculous. I'm just talking about human psychology at this point. The third simple term states, possible offspring of this animal will be divided one at a time between the partners as follows. Receiver, that's you, will get the first, third, fifth, etc. pick from the offspring. Owner, that's me, will get the second, fourth, etc. pick from the offspring. Now this third point is probably the part of the breeding loan that varies the most. How do you split up the animals? I've seen where people take the amounts of money that each animal is worth and then divide up uh, the offspring as such. Now that gets really complicated because you can't totally predict what's going to come out of each breeding. But just to let you know how that works, because it is a common one, let's say that you and I enter into an agreement and you bring a $1,000 animal to the table and I bring a $4,000 animal to the table. Well, the total combined value would be $5,000 of that pair. But you're going to say, just like shareholders in a large company, well, Garrett contributed 4000 of that, so he's going to then be an 80% shareholder in the clutch that results, whereas this other person is going to be a 20% shareholder. But the thing that you need to do if you divide that up, which does seem fair, is make sure exactly how you are going to determine who gets what when that clutch is born. The way that mine is written, we're saying that the person who has the animals is going to be fully responsible for all the feed, all the care, all the uh, housing of that animal, and any additional expenses that may arise unless you specify otherwise on any of those points. So because of that additional contribution that they're making over time, what we do is we give them first pick, then third, then fifth, and so on until it's done. That means, let's say there's 11 animals, whoever did the breeding not only gets first pick, but they also get six, while the other person gets five. So sometimes you can further split up what happens, you can put a what if 
What if there's one animal that blows all the other ones away? And at the end of the day, I resolve of myself that if the worst thing happened, if they completely ripped me off and then my animal died, that I would be able to wash my hands of it and let it go because I'm like a no drama, I don't hold things against people type of a guy. I would obviously never do another breeding loan with them and terminate any kind of business relationship at that point, but it would be so that we could continue to be friends in the future. So I like to keep it simple and say, hey, congratulations, you got a good one. And I and this is something that I verbally go over with them too, just so they understand you are entitled to that one awesome animal. Or if I'm the one who's doing the breeding, then I am entitled to that one awesome animal. And nobody's gonna piss and moan about that, right? Let's shake on it. The fourth term simply states, transport costs of the listed animal, as well as any offspring, will be paid by whatever party is shipping to the other. So if we break this down in layman's terms, it's if I'm shipping anything to you, I'll pay the shipping. If you're shipping anything to me, you pay the shipping. And the final term states this agreement will be valid until either one of the parties decides to end this agreement. In order to terminate the agreement, the other party must be notified at least 14 days in advance. This agreement is valid once both parties have signed below. And you go ahead and leave a spot for each of you to sign and date at the bottom. This last point, again, should be obvious, but it basically says the rules can't change halfway through. That's it, guys. Mine is fairly simple, um, and I obviously have other versions depending on other people that I may have worked with to do a breeding loan or any kind of arrangement, and that can be unique to each separate situation. That's it, that's all I can take, and hopefully that teaches you to not ask boring questions for us to make here on Free Tip Friday. But for those of you who stuck around the whole time, have a look at a sexy little snow golden child. This guy is awesome, aren't you Bubba? Yeah, he's gonna make a good breeder someday. The rest of you guys, have a great weekend.